So, Mr. Rebecca, thank you very much for coming here to University College Dublin today, and it's a it's a pleasure to, to welcome you to Dublin. Um, we're here to discuss after empire and to discuss, I suppose, the transition from one form of governance into another. In the case of South Africa, it's a little different in that South Africa really took its step towards self-government at the beginning of the 20th century. But that was only a step for a white minority in South Africa. And really, black South Africa never got its chance at self-determination until the end of the 20th century. South Africa's struggle is a long independent struggle. Um, in some ways, and I, I don't think I'd be um, incorrect in saying this, that you were born into it. I wonder, could you reflect on, on your family and how you first became aware of, I suppose, South Africa's place within the world and the black population's place within South Africa as a young person? Well, I mean, as you say quite correctly, the, uh, uh, the British, the British uh, abandoned direct British imperial rule in South Africa in 1910 but hand over power to the white minority uh, in, in South Africa. And so it meant for the, for the black population, the majority of the population, no change. And as you said, uh, in the end, uh, uh, the change comes for us in 1994. Now, the, the consequence of all that is that you've got, uh, uh, you've had a liberation struggle in South Africa stretching over a very long time, like here in Ireland, uh, <clears throat> with the specific emergence uh, of the African National Congress um, 104 years ago uh, to lead that liberation struggle. So, uh, so people like myself, uh, in a sense, you could say we, we are born into the ANC because this is the established representative organization of the black oppressed, accepted by the entirety of the black oppressed as their leader, whether they are members or not members. Uh, presidents of the ANC would be accepted among the black population as our national leaders. Uh, <clears throat> so we, here we are, we, young people, uh, you are faced with the reality of uh, apartheid and therefore this continued uh, colonial domination by that white minority and, uh, and the black population obviously is against all of that. Yeah. And so as a young person you don't really have to formally take a decision to be involved, the situation obliges you to be involved in the struggle for liberation. So really, basically, that's how we come into the struggle. Were you always aware there was something wrong with the government of South no, Africa? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's all around you as a black person. Yeah. Uh, the wrongness is all around you. Because how does that manifest itself on a daily basis? Well, it's a it's name, it's a name, a million years, for a million ways. Yes. For instance, uh, you, you have a, a, a white parliament, which gets elected by the white population. And you aren't there. So you got the white government that emerges out of that, which, which, which rules you. So, <clears throat> I mean, we grew up in, in a rural area. You have, uh, you've had massive land dispossession, land dispossession over many centuries. So we're in this rural area, and, and you can see with your eyes that the land is degraded, uh, it's not, can't produce enough food, uh, because the land is in the hands of white people. So I'm saying that impacts on you. You see uh, people coming back from the mines, because uh, this rural population can't live off the land. So they've got to migrate, go and work in the mines, go and work in the farms, go and work somewhere, we can come back home. And I mean, as we grow up, you see a lot of very sickly people, terrible cough, uh, you know, thin, 
they die, it's diseases of the land, which still causes they get in the in, in mining. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying you see the impact uh, of white oppression. It's it's all around you, uh, all the time. So if if the oppression was all around, I read that two of the portraits that were in your home as a child were of Gandhi and of Marx. Were these the figures you aspired to? Is that true? Uh, and also, what did those mean to you? Was there, a, was there a sense of hope that emanated from other struggles, from other liberations? Well, I mean, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, the, the particular history of South Africa, I'd be a person like Gandhi, you know that Gandhi, when he left England uh, as a lawyer, uh, went to South Africa, spent many years there, <clears throat> because you've got a sizable Indian, South African Indian population, originally from India. So that's why Gandhi came. So Gandhi, as we grow up, is, is not an, an Indian hero, he's a South African national hero. He's one of the people who's involved in the liberation struggle in South Africa. <laughs> so indeed you would find uh, 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 images of Gandhi in South Africa. Not so much because of what he did in India, but because he was part of the struggle within South Africa. And of course, the, 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 the later when he goes back to India and becomes this uh, major international figure. But already as South Africans, then that generation would have been very familiar with, with the Gandhi who was active in South Africa. Um, so he would be part, part, part of, our, of, of our group of heroes. The, uh, and then you see the South African Communist Party is formed in 1921. Uh, lots of white people are members of the Communist Party. And over the years, uh, uh, a relationship develops between the ANC and the Communist Party because they agree that we've got this system of white minority oppression apartheid and all that, and both these organizations were saying down with apartheid. So they cooperate. And so uh, this is the only party, only the only political party in South Africa, which has got white people, which works with the ANC on, on a basis of equality and so on. So obviously, therefore, the, 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 the white South African communists will have a particular relationship, will be a, take a particular place in the hearts of the black people, because rather than <coughs> being part of this minority oppressor nation, these whites, they, they are part of the struggle against white oppression. Yeah. And so therefore, the, 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 the leaders, <coughs> people who had been dealt, uh, treated as being heroic figures in the Communist Party like Karl Marx, the, the, the black population would have the same attitude. Yeah. Okay. And coming back to Gandhi, and you mentioned Gandhi's English days, you spent your student days um, in England and in the United Kingdom. Um, how important was your university experience in your coming of age and in your political awakening? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to answer a question like <laughs> that. I mean, the, uh, I mean, by the time I get to England, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 20 years old, uh, and I think by this time, uh, in terms of the, the politics of the ANC, uh, I think I'm sort of fully formed. I know the policies of the ANC, uh, what we need to do with regard to the South African struggle, uh, what relationship that struggle has uh, with regard to the rest of the struggles on the continent and elsewhere in the world. Uh, even uh, by the time I, <coughs> I arrive in England, I've listened to Robert Emmett's speech at the dock, uh, the uh, declaration, the, the 1916 uh, proclamation. Yeah, yeah. How, you, how are you aware of those, those documents and those, those individuals? No, it is because the part of the, the history of the development of the liberation struggle in South Africa, what it never developed in isolation. 
in this particular case that I'm talking about, for instance, you had uh, uh, one of our leaders is late now, Michael Hamel, who was a son of uh, Irish immigrants who had come into South Africa. <coughs> so he was born in South Africa and grew up there. But clearly kept, uh, certainly in sentimentally, kept a link to Ireland. So it's him <coughs> who, who then introduced us to this, this particular Irish history. Uh, so by the time I get to England, I'm exposed to all of this. Yeah. Sometimes in terms of uh, a political formation, uh, I don't think that uh, being in England in an English university uh, changed anything in terms of that political formation. But we're coming to study to university to study, get a degree and all that, which was done. But in terms of the political development, no, I don't think it, uh, in terms of the understanding of our struggle, what we needed to do, uh, and then, as I say, the interconnections between the South African struggle, the struggle in the rest of the continent and the rest of the world. So by the time I come to Sussex, all of these things are formed and. Uh, and so we live with that and guided by those sorts of positions <coughs> throughout, throughout our political life. I, I don't think it would be unfair to say you weren't exactly an ordinary student while you were in England. You um, at one stage organised in 1964 a march to London, um, not only to oppose the apartheid regime, but also to protest against the imprisonment of your own father. Um, you mentioned the international precedence for that. Were you aware of what was happening, particularly in America at the time with Martin Luther King? Were they the precedents you were trying to employ with that march, or what international examples were you looking at? No, the, uh, <coughs> you remember that by this time, uh, 1964, uh, you really had already a, a, a very strong anti-apartheid movement here in Ireland, uh, in, in the United Kingdom globally. At university, <coughs> We had uh, uh, students they set up uh, uh, an anti-racism society, that's what it was called, uh, which was not only opposed to apartheid, but generally to racism. So it took up the anti-apartheid the anti struggle, generally. And so when this issue arose, which was, um, you had this leadership of the ANC, uh, arrested, charged with treason, and the judge said guilty, and then postponed sentence. So it's between the guilty thing and the handing down of sentence that then the, you had a very big uh, mobilization globally to save the lives uh, of these prisoners because having been found guilty, the judge could then have said, I therefore sentence you to death. Uh, has happened to, to Robert Emmett. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why the mobilization. So the, uh, but I'm saying it comes at a time when you already have a very strong anti-apartheid movement globally. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, uh, so the response in this university, it was actually a decision of the anti-racism society, which said, look, we, we can't sit here and do nothing. What do we do uh, as as University of Sussex? And it was then agreed. Uh, even the uh, university administration got involved in this, and indeed the Brighton Town Council. So everybody agreed. Um, why don't we march to London? The concurrent struggle in Northern Ireland at the same time was still in its peaceful phase. How aware were you of? developments in Northern Ireland while you were in England? Oh, of course, we followed, we followed the struggle there. In the how, how, what did you think about developments in Northern Ireland at the time? Well, I mean, being familiar to some extent with Irish history, um, uh, it seemed to, to many of us that uh, what needed to happen was a proper political engagement uh, about the situation in Northern Ireland. Inclu in, including Ireland, to be involved in those discussions, to say, well, how do we address this 
this historic problem. Uh, and that, uh, in that sense, there was no military solution that was possible. Uh, and therefore, that uh, it, it was important at some point uh, to really seriously to engage why, why, why are these troubles? Why are there these troubles in the North, as, 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 as they were called? Uh, and what do we do to solve them? Which is, of course, in the end, that's where people came to. But uh, clearly, uh, even at that time, quite early on, uh, our own feeling was that uh, really you, you have to do that. Uh, we, we've discussed three different political conflicts so far. We've discussed the long Irish independence struggle. We've discussed the troubles in Northern Ireland and we've discussed the apartheid system in South Africa. In all of those, there was a mixture of non-violence and violence. Where do you see the role of political violence in an independence struggle? Well, I mean, I normally I do not think that anybody would choose to, to use violence as a first option. If you can bring about change by peaceful means, that's preferable. And for people who come from a liberation movement, the reason it's preferable is because you know for a fact that in situations of conflict, uh, violent conflict like that, the losses will be heavier on the part of the liberation movement. You are going to lose more people, uh, never mind how just your cause is. So, I mean, as a responsible leadership, you'd want to say, I don't want our people to die. But, <clears throat> of course, you then get into a situation where, as it has happened in the South African case, uh, and the ANC approached the South African regime many times to say, let us sit down as South Africans and together decide about the future of South Africa. And each time, the government, white governments wouldn't listen. And in, in the end, what they did, they responded by banning the ANC, by arresting people, and that, that, which of course then gives you no choice. You are not allowed to speak, to say anything, to say the thing is wrong. You can't demonstrate down the street. Your newspapers get banned, you know, all of that. In the end, you are obliged to take up arms. So it's in that situation, but I think that uh, normally, uh, I'm talking about serious liberation movements. Yeah, okay. they, would, they would say this option of violence is the last option because uh, you can't, uh, the enemy is better armed. They are running a state. They got an army, they got police, they got everything. You might have some arms, but the preponderant power is on the other side. And as I'm saying, you know for a fact that in a situation of conflict, you are the one who's going to lose the greater number of people. So you want to avoid it. But if the, if the enemy makes it impossible to avoid this, then you have no choice because otherwise you submit. Uh, so um, I think that, is the, that would be the relationship and that would be the point at which any serious liberation movement would say, we have really have no choice. Okay. The enemy is in insisting that we must submit and we're not going to submit, and therefore we have to fight. I'm interested, you just used a lot of military terminology in, in discussing that, you know, you've discussed the enemy and you've discussed the fight and you've discussed uh, uh, deploying your, your, your soldiers. Um, the end of the 1960s for you constituted a very dramatic change in your surroundings as much as your circumstances. You found yourself in Moscow at the Lenin School learning really the, the tactics of a soldier in a liberation army. What was that like for you? No, the, the military training we did, um, we trained as, a, well, that group of ours, that to which you refer, it was a, a chief of staff of a regiment of a guerrilla army. Now, I don't know what you know about soldiering. <laughs> no, uh, maybe not as much as you, but it sounds good. Now, a chief of staff. Yes. Uh, in a sense, is a CEO. You got the general who is in charge, commanding officer, 
And then you've got the, uh, 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 the chief of staff, who is the person who will then do all of the preparations, uh, like in the military terms, what is called a combat order, where you've got to say, we must attack on Monday, we must use the following forces, we must attack from the left and the right, and these are your reserve forces, you know, all of that. That's what the chief of staff does, uh, to prepare that so that the commander of the unit can then give the combat order based on that kind of, of preparation. So that's the training we're doing. <clears throat> Which, of course, I do take into account that we're, we're talking about an armed struggle in South Africa. So you've got to take into account the, the actuality of the situation. Uh, it's not, you don't have forests and, and mountains and, and, and the jungle and all that. Um, so how do you conduct a military struggle in a situation like that? So no, that kind of, uh, that kind of training. Is s some of your biographers have commented that you seemed much more comfortable with a book than a rifle and your time in Moscow was really a flourishing for political ideology rather than a military training for you. Did you return to the African continent after your time in Moscow feeling like a soldier or like an ideologue? No, you know, you see, the, uh, uh, I think you, uh, for, for some of us, uh, certainly some of my generation, the involvement in, in the struggle was, in a sense, multifaceted. Um, so in the, the, when I was in the Soviet Union, uh, in Moscow, part of the time, was in political education, uh, and some of it in military thing. Yeah. Because the, I mean, as a matter of normal course, you knew that it, it must be possible for us to, to, to participate in all of the forms of struggle yeah. in which organization is, is, is involved. If uh, there's military actions, you must be able to say something about that contribute positively. There's work of political organization, mobilization of the people, organization of the ANC structures and so on. You must be able to do that. Uh, engagement, uh, the, you know, the, the apartheid regime has its, got its own ideological and political perspective. And they broadcast all these messages uh, the reason we have apartheid is this and that to justify the system, you must be able to engage that discussion, your counter, your counter position. So the, the understanding of the politics becomes important. You got to mobilize the, the rest of the world um, to say, please join in this anti-apartheid struggle so that together we defeat this common enemy of humanity. So I'm saying that you need all of these various skills. Yes. Um, a revolutionary toolkit. So, yeah. I mean, you, 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 you couldn't avoid that. Sure. You, you couldn't say that, you know, I'm a, just a professional soldier. Uh, and if you say, no, but I want you to do sport, this political work, you say, no, no, no. I'm, no, you can't. Yeah. Uh, as, as part of the liberation movement, you had to have the capacity to be involved in all elements. Of, of, this, of this liberation struggle. One last question on your, on your time in the Soviet Union. Frequently, independence movements seek allies abroad, and in seeking those allies, they find the, the enemy of their enemy is, is their best friend. Did you, I suppose, how should I put this? Did you find that there was another empire there in the Soviet Union? Did you, did you see the Soviet Union as a utopia, or did you see the negative aspects of it when you were there in 1969-1970? No, and the general posture that we took uh, was that, you know, we, we've got a major problem, a major challenge in South Africa yeah. uh, to defeat this apartheid regime and uh, let South Africa become a democratic country. It's a major challenge. And we want the whole world to support us, yeah. everybody. And of course, what you then get is that the countries in the rest of the world respond differently. Soviet Union, 
Sweden, other Scandinavian countries say we're with you in the struggle. Then the British government, the Americans, and so on, take a different position. Uh, but I'm saying from our point of view, we wanted everybody to support. So because of that, uh, really just as a matter of policy, we said it's critically important that we avoid getting engaged in anything which has to do with assessing uh, individual countries because we are going to get into a lot of trouble. Um, if, if we say, uh, uh, we will accept your support on condition you do the following things in your country. We can, can do that. Okay. So we generally avoided uh, this sort of comments. But the Soviet Union was a very strong supporter, um, quite consistently. Did you value that support? Was it a, was it was it a, was it a welcome ally? It was very yeah. important. Okay. They took a lot of our students to educate in the Soviet in the universities. Uh, ordinary students, they trained a lot of our people, the military ones, uh, supplied equipment. Uh, a lot of the refugee populations that we have, we had in Africa, uh, a lot of the food came from the Soviet Union. So it was kind of all around support. And of course, they would support us at the United Nations. Um, so <clears throat> the Soviets, the Swedes, Sweden was very important. They never involved in the, on the military side, but everything else, uh, support for the uh, sanctions, uh, material support in terms of food and clothing and so on, including the struggles inside the country, a uh, very important role. And, uh, but I'm saying in all instances, we said, uh, that we, let's get everybody to support us uh, and avoid getting in, entangled in making assessments about what they do, they are doing in their own countries. The ANC was incredibly successful at bringing global attention to the apartheid sure. regime in mm -hmm. Africa. Um, were you aware of the efforts being made here in Ireland, and in particularly cognizant of Dunn Stores, one of the grocery stores here in Ireland? Um, the workers there refused to handle South sure. African goods during the 1980s. It ended up being one of the longest industrial disputes sure. in Irish history. Um, were you aware of those actions that were being carried out at a local level and how much did they mean to you? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I remember the done, the done strikes. Done stories, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, no, but uh, you had uh, here in Ireland, <coughs> one of our leading people, uh, Professor Kada Asman, an ANC member, uh, uh, was a Trinity. Uh, I mean, I came here, I, uh, I did an anti-apartheid meeting at the University of Cork. Uh, so... Uh, Tell us more about that. No, it was... What was that like? It, it, was, it was very good. Uh, yeah. The Irish anti-apartheid, they arranged these meetings. And they said to me, come, there's a meeting must address in Cork. Uh, fine, came, and uh, it was at the university. It was very good. The hall was... Uh, the crowd receptive. Oh, very, 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 very much so. The hall was very full. And, uh, and, and very Irish. Really? How, uh, what, what, what marked it as being particularly Irish for you? You see, for instance, uh, <coughs> there was an old man here in the hall, white hair. And he says to me, um, now, Mr. Mbeki, can you tell me... Uh, have you heard of uh, James Connolly? So I said, yes. So he says, have you read anything by James Connolly? So I said, no. Uh, have you heard of Patrick Pierce? I said, yes. Have you read anything by Patrick Pierce? No. I think he mentioned a couple of other people. And he said to me, uh, at the end of the meeting, I'm going to give you a list of books to read. Because you need to understand the liberation struggle in Ireland, which has gone on for many centuries. Because I think <clears throat> that you must learn some lessons from our struggle, which are going to be important for you in, in South Africa. So indeed, I said, fine. <laughs> I'm saying it was important because you, can only, you could only get that discussion, that kind of discussion here in Ireland. 
if you did anti-apartheid meetings in England, as we did, I mean, you'd go to a meeting, and they would be asking you questions about what pensions do black people get? What pensions do white people get? You know, that kind of question. Legitimate. Okay. Legitimate questions and so on. But here at Cork, the question was, what lessons can you draw from the Irish liberation struggle in order to defeat that regime in South Africa? You would never meet that kind of question in England. But here you would. It's um, fascinating. So it was, I'm saying, uh, it was very Irish. It was <laughs> Irish. And of course, uh, uh, you had a lot of uh, people in black cassocks there, nuns and brothers and so on in the meeting. Yeah. And we engaged very, it was very, very uh, engaging. The, the Irish clergy, both nuns and priests, have had a, an incredibly far reach in Africa. Um, how positive do you think that that influence was or how, how do you feel towards particularly religious aid and, and how that, I suppose, created such a strong link between Afri uh, South Africa and Ireland? Yes, of course, I mean, the, uh, um, I think one of the things that uh, we must understand is during the colonial period, um, the emergence of the black intelligentsia uh, it actually came from mission schools. So the missionaries who came out of Europe uh, opened these various schools. Uh, and that's really where your first, I'm saying, your first black intelligence I emerged from. It's from those mission schools. In the end, though, uh, the churches became a very important part of the broad internal struggle uh, in South Africa, the mobilization of the people to do all sorts of things, plus, plus the global anti-apartheid movement. Uh, they played a very, very important role there. So, <clears throat> and it wouldn't matter, uh, people might have come originally from Ireland or, what, or whatever else, um, but the, 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 the Christian church, and, and, and more broadly, the religious communities in South Africa were very central in terms of the mobilization of the population to oppose, to oppose the apartheid system. And you're coming from a very left family background. You're coming from presumably something of an anti-clerical um, emergence, or at least an anti-clerical family. How do you see the, that, that strange alliance, and we see it between J James Connolly and Paulie Pierce, I suppose, here in Ireland. How do you see that strange alliance between the religious church and its role in, in South African liberation and then the left? Well, no, I don't think uh, I don't think anybody uh, in the in the liberation movement was anti-clerical. Okay. They might not be members of a church or anything, or might even be atheist, yes. but they wouldn't be anti-clerical because you see the uh, uh, you have this majority of the South African population, whether communists. Uh, uh, priests, uh, capitalists, who share this common thing that we've got a system here of white minority rule, which is impacting negatively on all our lives. Whether you are a priest or a communist or whatever, uh, and it's in our interest that we act together to get rid of this thing. So this is a grand alliance? Oh, absolutely, and, uh, and it, it cohered. So you would never find a member of the Communist Party saying, I'm not going to attend this meeting because there's a bishop who's going to speak, no. I'd, I'd like to cross that Rubicon of 1994 and move from the independent struggle into a, a, a black governing free South Africa. Um, I was thinking over the week as, as to that, that transition when independence leaders now rule in independent country and I was actually struck by an Irish language poem. And that poem is, is by a, an Irish language poet called Kathleen Maud. She wrote in 1963, this poem is called Trowel, which is an Irish word for rage or anger. And it starts off, Tordum Cossar na Tua Gumrishigus Gamilig and Chokshu, um, which is Irish for hand me a, a hammer or an ax that I can tear down this house, referring to that process of revolution. And then 
at the end of the poem she says hand me the nails and allow me to build up a new house but she says but i'm so tired now did you feel that sense of one liberation movement being a, an appropriate leadership to take over the role of governance and is leading an independent struggle one thing but leading a government a very different thing yeah of course it is yeah how did you rise to that challenge well you know the uh, uh, in a way the what needed to happen uh, once uh, the struggle to remove this white minority regime was won, uh, the situation in South Africa actually more or less dictated what needed to happen. Uh, because here, uh, okay, the apartheid regime is gone, you've got a democratically elected government, and the ANC is the majority party. Uh, but what, what kind of society have you inherited? Uh, you've inherited a society where you got these racial divisions. But you want to build a non-racial society uh, out of these various black and white segments of the population. What do you do about that? The history of colonization, 300, 350 years of uh, colonial, colonialism, apartheid and all that, uh, has produced these inequalities in society which unfortunately are also defined in racial terms. Uh, how do you address that? You, you got a situation where um, the, the, the apartheid system deliberately, deliberately, consciously, went out of its way to ensure that your black population is as little educated as is possible, deliberately, consciously, what is it that you do to impact on the education and the skills and all of that? So I'm saying this the situation itself, in a sense, di di dictated what needed to happen. So indeed, of course, the ANC sits down and says, what do we want to make of this democratic power in terms of the transformation of South Africa from this apartheid society to this new non-racial, non-sexist society. So, I mean, it's a much more challenging job. The, uh, the education non non-racial, non non-sexist South Africa, uh, all of these education questions we are talking about, the economy, etc. they are all interlinked. Uh, so, uh, this is part of the challenge of the transformation of South Africa after empire. There isn't anything uh, which is not urgent. So you can't say, for this month or year, we'll, let's focus on this thing. We'll come back to other things later. You can't, the, because of the inter the linkages among these things. So uh, you've got to do something about the economy. You know, we inherit an economy that was in decline uh, in, in all respects. So we had to change the direction so that you have a growing and a developing economy and so on with its consequences. So you've got to do that. Among other things, the, uh, you've got this massive black population without any safety net. Uh, that was part of the apartheid system of the racism. But you've now got a democratically elected government. It can't ignore the fact that there's so many people who are poor. How did you address that on a practical level? So, I mean, what, what, part of what had to be done, which, 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 which was done, was indeed to create a safety net. To say that, uh, in, fundamentally, in the end, to eradicate the problem of poverty means creating of jobs and, 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 and all of that. Uh, proper uh, pay levels and, and so on. But in the meantime, that takes time to rebuild an economy that produces that kind of outcome. But in the, in, in the meantime, there are people who are desperately poor. So there has to be some, as I'm saying, a safety net so that people at least don't fall below this. So indeed, we then introduced, South Africa still runs that now, a very extensive social security system. Um, 
I think now I can't remember what the numbers are, 12 million more people who get one grant of one kind or another uh, because you just couldn't allow this uh, extreme poverty. Uh, so, but, but those things you, you had to do. But again, you can only do that if the economy is producing the necessary resources to enable you to do that. So I'm saying that you, you, you are addressing the poverty thing uh, on the basis of this economic intervention. And as you do that, you are also addressing this matter about inequality, black and white. Yeah. Uh, to bring up these very, very poor black people, bring them a, a, a little bit up so that to some extent they catch up uh, with the rest and so on. So I'm saying that we, we had to move on all of this. Speaking, speaking of the economy, I'd also like to move on to foreign relations. And South Africa went to become a, a member of G20 and you yourself attended G G20 summits. Which of the particular international organizations or international groups that South Africa is now a part of, the Commonwealth, the African Union, G20, do you see as being the most important for South Africans' international relations? Well, I mean, the first important one is the African Union. Okay. And you were instrumental yeah. of changing that from the Organization of African Unity sure. into the African Union. Sure. We're, we're certainly very much involved in that process. That's the first one. It's okay. uh, because the cohesion on the African continent is very important uh, in terms of all of the member countries, including South Africa. The uh, capacity, the ability to act together and cooperate within the continent, but also to be able to represent the interests of the continent vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. It's a critical organization, that one. Of course, I would say that the, uh, um, the next important one uh, W would be uh, uh, the United Nations, okay. uh, from our point of view, because uh, here is the one uh, truly inclusive, multilateral, intergovernmental, interstate organization, the UN. And it's this one body, if it was functioning properly, which would enable smaller countries, like the various African countries, uh, to be able to play a proper role in the world. If, you know, the, uh, everybody says the rule of law is very important, agreed. If you take the Security Council, the Security Council is bound by uh, what is contained in the UN Charter. And that UN Charter will say that Security Council can intervene in whatever country uh, to protect international peace and security. That's a law. Yeah, yeah. But you see the many instances when the Security Council intervenes in countries with nothing to do with international peace and security, but because you've got some powerful countries in the UN, which then as it were, they write their own law. That can't be right, um, because the, if we all say, let's, let's all respect the rule of law, including rule of international law, then that protects the interest of the smaller countries. So I'm saying that the UN becomes very important uh, from that point of view uh, for us. <clears throat> but of course, they are the, um, um, the more directly developmental things. Like, like the G20. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before that, the, uh, we had built a very good working relationship between the African continent and the G8. Yeah. Um, to get the G8 to support the development programs of the African continent as defined by the Africans. And they had agreed to that. But in the end, that got overtaken by the G20. In terms of South Africa's sphere of influence and, and your neighbors, um, in some senses, you've been criticized quite heavily for the role you played with quiet diplomacy with Robert Mugabe and with Zimbabwe. Um, do you look back on that differently now, or do you think it was important that you left a door open for a country that was going in a very um, dangerous direction in the early part of this century? Well, you know, the, uh, I, we, we always were 
somewhat puzzled by this notion of quiet diplomacy. Because there's no other diplomacy except quiet diplomacy. I mean, well, I, mean, I suppose loud hailer diplomacy is the, is the not, opposite. Then yeah. it's not diplomacy. Yeah, it's yeah. If you start campaigning there with loud hailers, that's something else. No, the, the critical matter with regard to Zimbabwe is the matter that we insisted upon, and I'm sure we'll continue to say, insist on it, is that we've got to respect the, the right of the people of Zimbabwe to decide their future. That uh, it was not for South Africa to impose on the Zimbabwe people, or anybody for that matter, uh, anybody to impose uh, some solution on the, on the people of Zimbabwe. You know, one of our sharpest differences about this matter was with the British government sure. yeah, under uh, the Prime Minister Tony Blair. Because the British government were saying to us directly, uh, we, we've got to look for ways and means physically to remove Robert Mugabe and put somebody else in the place. And we would say, it's not your duty, it's not your responsibility. This regime change thing. Yeah. Who, who gives you the right to determine who should be the regime of Zimbabwe? As for the Zimbabwe people, what we have to do is to make sure that we encourage all the Zimbabweans to get together and sit and seriously consider, as, as happened with regard to Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. sit seriously among themselves and consider what happens with their country. That's what's got to happen. And we insisted on this. Yes. And this is what was called quiet diplomacy. But we would, we would always take a position like that. That we, we have no, South Africa doesn't have a right to, uh, to say we don't like the government of such and such a country. And for which reason, we'll make sure that they go uh, and we'll uh, put in place such and such a solution. We don't. I, I can appreciate your point on, on self-determination and not interfering in, in the, the sovereign concerns of a neighbour. However, do you think that, what would you say to your detractors who say that you legitimise the rule of Robert Mugabe and particularly some of his most um, unpalatable and, and deeply questionable policies that were being carried out? Well, I would say people must demonstrate that, you know, yeah. instead of making general statements. You see, for instance, uh, around uh, maybe 2001 or thereabouts, the opposition party uh, in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. the Movement for Democratic Change, they approached us, the South African government, and said, can you please help? We want certain amendments to the Zimbabwe constitution. Uh, can we, we want certain amendments to the Zimbabwe constitution. Can you please talk to the ruling party and the government of Zimbabwe to do that. So we said fine, which we did. And uh, you would recall that there had been a, a, a constitutional referendum in Zimbabwe in 2000, which the ruling party lost. So when we talked to them to say, look, your opposition are saying they want these amendments to the constitution, they said, but many of these things that they want are in the constitution which they rejected. But anyways, that's when the engagement between the Zimbabweans, the opposition and the ruling party started. Yes. None of them, I'm talking about elected representatives of the people of Zimbabwe, none of them ever said to us, please intervene to overthrow a government. Okay. What they said, please help us to get together and so, so we, you, which, you, which you see your did. role as being a facilitator rather than which we did. You see, a regime changer. I'm saying that uh, if you take, for instance, uh, 2008 election uh, in Zimbabwe, the parliamentary election, yes. which everybody accepted was free and fair and so on. That's the election where the uh, Morgan Chang Rai's uh, faction of the uh, MDC yes. got the highest number of seats. It didn't get an overall majority, but it was the biggest party in that parliament. And everybody accepted that thing, which is the result of which, that's why you have a government of national unity. Because you had three parties, none of which had an absolute majority. So they decided the best thing to do, let's form this government of national unity and so on. So, but I'm saying all of them 
those parties. All they said to us, please help us to get together as Zimbabweans to decide our future. And then somebody from very far away says, you know, you must have removed this. Who, why? Who, on whose authority? It, it is Zimbabweans, I'm saying. Even the opposition in Zimbabwe never ever said to us, please help us to get rid of Mugabe. Do you think the fact that you step down peacefully, that you set up COPE as a new political party, does that, is that a testament to South Africa's political maturity now in the, in the early years of the 21st century? No, I, I don't know. Maybe, I, I, maybe it did. I don't know. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, I would have considered it to be, uh, it would have been natural in terms of the ANC. Because as I say, I mean, we, we grew up in the ANC. So the value system that you carry in your head, it comes from there. So in this case, uh, in 2008, when the National Executive Committee of the ANC says, uh, for whatever reason, we, we think that uh, you should uh, resign your position as, as president. So I said, fine. Uh, uh, you know, if it, this is my leadership in the ANC is saying that. Uh, it would be normal for any ANC person to behave like that. Uh, so it was not uh, as this kind of, I'm saying it may have been a manifestation of that maturation. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying from the point of view of an ANC member, I think it was normal as an ANC thing. You, you would have seen that um, before. Not, not relating to government, but to changes of leadership in the ANC itself. When uh, uh, there will be an alternative person put forward as a presidential candidate, and somebody else loses or withdraws we, without fighting or saying, I insist, I know I must continue. No, it, it would have been very contrary uh, to the historical practice uh, of, of the ANC for me to say, I disagree with this leadership, therefore I stay. I'm saying that it may have been a manifestation of that maturation, uh, but it would have been a normal process in terms of ANC politics. Did you ever have a succession plan? Did you ever identify a clear successor for yourself? No. Do you again, think again, we never had that practice. The way the, the, the ANC has never had the practice. It, it, of, uh, I, I'm mindful of this, and we've spoken about Irish historical examples already. Perhaps uh, an earlier Irish example, I don't know if you, if you know about it or not, but Charles Stuart Parnell was the leader of the Home Rule movement that was very strong on the land question and others. And it, one of the greatest criticisms of his leadership, very charismatic, very popular leadership in the 1880s, but he never had a succession plan. He cultivated lots of talent, but he never cultivated one clear successor. Do you think your legacy might have been stronger or maybe the transition of power might have been easier if you had nominated one successor in the ANC? Or is it, was oh, it that even I, your call? I think the ANC would have rebelled against it. Uh, no, it, the, the, the NC does not have any history of incubating successors. Okay. It doesn't. Ma uh, many would have seen Jacob Zuma as your natural successor and seen that, sure. that almost as a handing over of the crown. Sure, p p people yeah. might very well have done that, yeah. but in terms of uh, grooming and preparing a successor, no, 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 you can't do that. You think it's in integral to democracy that as one person stands down an open election. Yes, no, no, it's a, uh, you know, there, there's a, there has been historically, historically there's a lot of uh, sensitivity within the ANC. This is part of its own historical development, including the value system it develops. A great deal of sensitivity about uh, anything to do with saying, uh, I am leadership material, elect me. Okay. No. So to come to ANC people to say, uh, I have appointed this person. Uh, I think this person must succeed as a, a, a leader. 
they would say, but why, do, why are you thinking for us? Uh, we, we, we know who, who should be a leader. We don't, have, we don't have this tradition whatsoever. And how, how do you look back on that period now, 2007, 2008? Is it still painful for you personally? And also, do you think that an irreconcilable rift has opened up between your own loyal followers and the followers of Jacob Zuma? No, I don't, <coughs> I don't think so. I don't think there's any... I don't know if there were such followers. Because if um, uh, if people looked at the well, this discussion has taken place in South Africa. Uh, if you look at policy positions, um, there's no way you can say Mbeki represented his policies as opposed to Zuma's policies, which is the following. It's it, it's it, it's not there. And is there a tribal language. divide between Dosa and? No. and and so, uh, no, it's no tribe. What quite occasioned this yeah. uh, was uh, uh, statements made by a judge. Okay. This had to do with this uh, court case, the then, yes, yes. So we're, we're, the then yeah. court case against Jacob Zoom. Yes. And the judge uh, who presided over that case said, uh, our government, including the president, had interfered with the polit with the uh, processes. In terms of education, a, a lot of people who I've spoken to on this have said that really education is the root of a stronger, more powerful, assertive, stable South Africa. You've benefited hugely from international education. How do you think um, a, a more robust education system can be rolled out in South Africa? And do you think that access to education is sufficient in modern South Africa? Yeah, no, sure, no, the, it's, it's quite correct what you are saying about the critical importance of education. <clears throat> no, the South African educational system needs a very, very lot of, of very serious attention. At the primary level, one of our biggest challenges is the quality of the teachers. Okay. Uh, it's something that really we've got to avoid. There are attempts. To, to attend to this. But it's a continuing uh, consequence of uh, uh, the educational system that had been established during the apartheid years. Just for instance, a specific example. Um, at some stage, you would have uh, uh, people graduating from teacher training college. And you'd find that many of them have got distinctions in biblical studies. Yeah. So 85 percent, 85 out of 100 distinctions in biblical studies. And one out of 100 with some distinction in mathematics. That impacts on the quality of teaching. Yeah. That's, that's a major challenge uh, at that level. Uh, you've got uh, uh, major challenge in terms of training of people with skills. Uh, again, because what had happened was that the, the technical colleges that you needed to train fitters and tenors and you know, all of that, that instruction was very weak. Okay. It's been a challenge since liberation to build up that capacity, including, uh, again, you found I'm talking about specific instances where, for instance, you'd find a, 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 a technical college like that, training people for the automobile industry. Yeah. And they graduate uh, to go and start working in a plant. I'm talking about direct experience that I saw. Okay. And the, 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 the motor car company says to me, now, you see, President, these are graduates from the technical college but we have to train them from the beginning because the equipment that is used in the technical college is 15 years old. It's over te te technological development that we've taken them. So these people, they've trained on old equipment, qualified, but they can't cope with the equipment as it is now, that, that kind of thing. Then you've got the issues that have been raised now by the university students. Uh, 
and but affordability of education. Moving on to, to public health, and it's, it's an issue that arguably touches women more so than men. Um, it could arguably s be said that one of the greatest challenges of, of post-apartheid South Africa has been the AIDS crisis. Um, some of your critics have been quick to point your policies on AIDS as some of the most controversial of your presidency. Um, looking back, do you still have that stance on AIDS and HIV? And is there anything you would have done differently as regards the AIDS crisis in Africa in your presidency? No, no, no. I wouldn't have done anything differently. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss oh, this. Yes, okay. You see, for instance, uh, then I'll give you just one year. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take the year 2006, well, let me start off by saying the, uh, the official statistics body in South Africa, uh, the Statistical Authority, they publish uh, uh, annual reports about mortality and causes of death every year. Yes. 2006, uh, uh, annual report, mortality and cause of death. That report gives uh, deaths from what it calls deaths from HIV disease as being number nine in terms of the ranking. 2006 will say that, 2007 will say that, 2008 will say that, 2009 will say that. Number nine, <clears throat> it has never been this dominant killer in South Africa. And your, your position has always been that poverty is, is a, a bigger curse in South Africa than AIDS itself. No. Mm -mm. Okay. The, the, my argument has been, you see, that's why I'm, <coughs> I'm saying we don't have enough time. Yes, yes. You see, we are dealing with AIDS. Mm -hmm. AIDS, the acronym AIDS means acquired immune, immune deficiency, syndrome, deficiency yes. syndrome. Central to the syndrome is immune deficiency. What causes immune deficiency? Which is central to this. <coughs> if you look in a medical textbook, an ordinary medical textbook, it will tell you these are the various things that cause immune deficiency. Poverty is one of them. These recurrent diseases are a part of this. Uh, diseases like syphilis will, will, will cause this. So you've got a number of things which cause immune deficiency. Yes. So my argument has been you can't respond to the issue of immune deficiency in AIDS without one kind of intervention. But do you agree that there's a viral cause to AIDS? Sure, I have no problem with that. And do you, do you believe that AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease or can be sexually transmitted? Sure, I have no problem with that. Well then, could, could simple policies like the promotion of condoms and physical contraceptives be a useful way to stop the spread oh, of this disease? <coughs> you need it yeah. also, a problem in South Africa, issues of teenage pregnancies. The condoms and all this and are very important. If you look at the health profile, if you want to discuss the health profile of the South African population, you wouldn't start where you started. Okay. You would say, what is the biggest killer in South Africa? Even today. Yeah. <clears throat> the last report uh, of the um, Statistical Authority, which was it covered the year 19, 2013, it puts the uh, deaths from HIV as number three from the original number nine, there are three. Yeah, yeah. There are questions that arise about that. What the questions are <coughs> from 2008, 2009. Uh, the public health system has provided all of the antiretroviral drugs that you need. Yeah. That's why nobody makes any noise about it because the current government has responded like that. The problem <coughs> I'm saying is that in the midst of that, as a, as a killer, this rises from number nine to number three. Why? Well, what do you have? I don't know. But that's a question that needs to be discussed. Yeah. 
<clears throat> because the response that was expected, let's flood the country with antiretroviral drugs. This is the consequence. The opposite, I'm not saying, let me say the opposite. What's happened practically, yeah. the absolute number of people who are dying from what is classified as HIV disease has increased. Yeah. And as a proportion of deaths, it's increased. So somebody needs to ans ask the question, why? Why does the South African government not look at some of the less glamorous, but probably more fundamental work, like working on public drinking water rather than working on antimicrobial resistance? Would they be more important public policies on health and, and public sanitation to carry out, sure. even if they're less glamorous? No, but no, is but that being pursued in South Africa? But those things are being done. But not at the rate they could be done. And, and for instance, there is a lot of money being pumped into things like antimicrobial resistance in South African scientific research, where when you don't have a clean public drinking water system for everybody, is, is that really no, the, no, the top the, priority? I mean, the, the, the yeah. issue about clean water yeah, yeah. and access of water uh, by all communities, all families, it's an old program. As soon as we came into government, that I don't think that... Uh, and it's still uh, not over, though. Sure, I mean, sure, the, the, it's not as though where uh, you say one day everything is concluded. Mm. The population grows, new communities emerge, and, and all that. But I don't think it's uh, the, the thing about clean water is, uh, is, is a major issue of debate. Okay. Uh, the issue of sanitation, also, that's an, a, a, a bigger matter of debate, yeah. that sanitation issue, because the supply of clean water, the, supply, the, 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 the sanitation bit, hasn't quite caught up with the supply of clean water. So that's a matter that is openly discussed in South Africa. Yeah. But the, uh, <coughs> I mean, clean water is, is a very important in terms of health. Well, naturally. Uh, naturally, you uh, questions of nutrition. Mm. Uh, what kind of nutrition do people have access to? Is it healthy? Is it adequate? You know, all of this. So all of these things you've got to attend to as you attend to the human body. <clears throat> but I'm saying, coming back to the health thing, you see, really, if there was time, we would have to look at this profile to say, look, South Africa pro produces its health statistics. One of the few countries on the African continent that actually has got real statistics, not estimates. Mm. Uh, here are these statistics. Now let's look at these things. Uh, why, if, if you look, for instance, at this table I'm talking about, uh, 2013, yes. uh, report on uh, mortality and cause of death. They break it down by the racial groups in South Africa, that report. And you will find that TB is the biggest killer in the country. But zero for the white population, no incidence of TB, and no incidence of HIV disease among the whites, no incidence of TB among the Indian population, no incidence of HIV among the Indian population in the statistics. So um, I, I ask a question, yeah. why is that? And why do you think? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither yeah. of us are, yes. Because it would be yeah. important to answer that question. Yeah. Because it may then be that what South Africa needs to say, then let us get the section of the population which shows death from HIV to do the things that these other sections of the population do, which don't have any, just to draw and so, enter that kind of. Yes. A change of, change of lifestyle, change of culture, change Whatever of Whatever it is that you've yes, got to yeah. change. I don't know what it yeah, is you've got yeah. to change. Yeah. Uh, but maybe that's what needs to happen. That's why I'm saying okay. the matter needs to be studied. In a world where Europe and America are central at the moment, in 50 years' time, do you see a world in which the continent of Africa and the country of South Africa are more central? And what do you think South Africans and Africans more generally need to do today to achieve that? Well, as, <coughs> as I said to you earlier, uh, it's, uh, it's been, been, been very important for us as South Africa to ensure that we, we have a continent of Africa 
that behaves in a cohesive manner. And therefore, an organization like the African Union has been very important that it should be strong. I was saying partly to address the matter of the integration of the African Union, of the African continent, leading to, 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 to Union, but also to make sure that Africa is properly represented in terms of the governance of the globe. And that's where we've got to start. And I said, the UN is very important. The restructuring of the Security Council becomes important, as would be addressing this issue of voice for the African continent with regard to organizations like the IMF, World Bank, WTO, and so on. So that's a struggle that we've got to wage. How do you so fashion the, the system of global governance that you have a more equitable system uh, in terms of decision making, etc., across the board? The second thing, which is important, is uh, the restructuring of the economic relations between Africa and the rest of the world. You see, for instance, one of the big issues on the African continent is issue of the economic partnership agreements between Africa and the EU. Because the EU insists that uh, there must be a recipro reciprocal relationship between these African countries and the EU. You can't, you can't have reciprocal relations between the African countries and the EU. You have got a Germany here and an Ireland and a France that are and very poor African countries. So if, if I allow a, a banana from your country to enter the EU a duty free, you must then allow whatever. So that challenge of free trade remains that's a major right. so issue. Yeah. It, can't, it can't be reciprocal. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's what defines the economic partnership agreements, yes. which would then actually perpetuate this old economic system globally of the wealthy countries of Europe and America yeah. and the poor South. So do we've got to change things like that. And do you foresee a future where the continent of Africa will be treated more equitably in the future? So we, we at least we've got to fight for it. And you think that that change will come from Africa? It must come from, in a sense, now speaking as a South African, in a sense, we've got to draw on our experience of developing that global anti-apartheid movement. We need to develop a similar movement to say it's in the interest of all humanity that the countries of the South should develop and grow. It's in the interest of all humanity. So let all humanity unite to achieve this goal because everybody will benefit from it. Maybe we need to co go back there. So that it's not just a matter of the Africans uh, fighting on their own mm -hmm. for that equitable treatment and linking up with other countries of the South, which, which is happening, but link up globally. We, are, we, want, we want Ireland. Yeah. We so want Ireland, Ireland to be on our side to say we agree with the Africans. Let's restructure the global economy so that these countries can also grow, because it will give us, us as Ireland, a bigger market to export to them and you know all of that. So we'll all benefit. So I'm saying to develop a global uh, alliance, uh, really to change uh, this, this, this relationship between North and South, basically, for the benefit of the South, to make sure that you we do indeed move towards the eradication of poverty and underdevelopment in the countries of the South. And reciprocal arrangements with the EU are not going to help. Well, on so that we, will, we will win. And on that we very positive win. note, I must thank you very much for your very generous um, gift of your time and for being so frank with me today on all these questions. Mr. Mbeki, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.